Hey, thanks for joining me. Um, this is a video I didn't want to make um, because of, well, everyone knows, right? Everyone who kind of follows comic know, comics knows what's happened. Um, Ed Piscor uh, has taken his life and he's gone. And the build up to this whole situation, this isn't something that I don't think anybody ever saw that coming. I'll be honest, the build up to the whole situation, I as it was going on over the last week, I actually in the back of my head was like, this is really bad for him. What if he did this? What if that actually is what happened? And I just never really thought that that was actually be a possibility. And it come up, it's been released out into the public. Um, it's been out there in the public uh, for about the past four or five hours as of the, this recording. And I've been debating back and forth with myself of whether or not I should bother to say something about it. But um, it's got me way more disturbed and emotional than I ever actually expected myself to be. I didn't think that I would have the kind of reaction that I, I have been having. And um, I've been kind of going over it in my head. And honestly, I think maybe I should just I should wait and just kind of sit with it for a day or two or three before I say anything on it. But I guess I've decided to just sit down and talk about it while it's fresh in my mind. For those of you who don't know, and I don't think there's any of you who don't, but um, you know, there's the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. It's been a popular comics channel with Ed Piscor and Jim Rugg going on for the last four or five years, something like that. They're working professionals. Um, and uh, they sat down and just started recording videos talking about, to start, Wizard Magazine and uh, then getting into comics and just giving their opinion on it. And it sounded to me, it, well, to me it was extremely interesting because of two things. One, they both talked about how they were collecting comics since they were kids and they talked about the books that they would pick up when they were younger, which many of them was the same stuff that I would pick up. And they had a lot of the same reactions that many of us did to the same comics at the time. But the interesting thing about those two is they got sick of the corporate comic nonsense bullshit real fast and went in search of other things, went in search of other comics that gave them the kind of the artistic and creative satisfaction that they longed for that modern comics just didn't do. They weren't getting it from Batman and X-Men. They moved on and went and found other things by tons of other creators. And both Ed and Jim were incredibly well-versed in all kinds of creators and books and art, technique, art techniques and methods and production principles and just all kinds of things I had no idea about. These guys know everything. And it's combined with them being fans as well as being guys who've been making comics. And they know how to do it. And they learned and built up themselves. And then they created this channel to talk about it. So they gave a unique perspective of fans of comics, of which there's a million of us out there yapping about this stuff online, myself included now. But there are also guys who make comics. And so they can talk about it. And I'm going to be honest, that is their, them talking about comics was a big influence on me wanting to do this. In the same vein also that I also make my own comics. Those of you who follow my channel and have done for any length of time, you know that I'm showing my own artwork quite often, my own fan-made comics, all my own stuff. And so in a way, I hope that gives me a little bit of distinction from just the uh, regular guys out there who just read comics and sit them down and talk about them. I, I can talk about the actual creation process because I do sit down and put paper and pencil and ink on paper and create my own books. And I've got a little time, I got a little body of work that I can show. And I think that gives a little bit different kind of insight into the, the comic world when I'm, I can read a book and talk about what it must be like to draw this page. How do you figure this out? How do you figure out the perspective? How do you do the anatomy? How do you do the storytelling? What works? What doesn't? It's all you know, kind of a learning process. And um, I think that's one of the things that's made my channel somewhat successful. It's more successful than I ever thought it would ever be. I'm still a little nobody, but um, it's gotten farther than I ever thought it would. And the Cartoonist Kayfabe guys were a big influence on that in a big way. I've learned so much from them and their channel. 
And um, I'm certainly not the only one doing this. There's lots of guys out there. Blood Force Mitch is another guy you should go check out. A guy that basically does the same thing I do. We sit down, we talk about comics, and we talk about the comics that we're making on our own. You know, we all do our own kind of similar things. But the situation that come up recently with Ed Piscor is he was accused of having in inappropriate conversations with an underage girl three or four years ago when she was 17. And, I mean, I don't want to get into it too much. Um, it, it certainly wasn't the smartest thing he could have ever done. But even as I read the screenshots, I'm like, okay, this looks bad, but he didn't technically do anything wrong. And so, but people were like, well, this is just grooming behavior and he's, he could have this and he could have that. And what don't we know? And then there was a lot of people who just were out for blood, like get him. He's this and that. I'm, I'm kind of cautious about saying certain words because I'm worried that the YouTube algorithm will hear it and flag the video or something like that, that you don't want to say, but you know, the unfortunate situation of an old man talking to a younger girl, there's no way that that looks good. And People were just out to get him. They're like, he he's done. We we hate him. He's a he's a creeper. And now suddenly people were all up all up in arms about, yeah, I've had this feeling about him for a long time. I never liked his I he, I don't like the way he talks. What does he wear those sunglasses for? What is he wearing all those hats for? He's just like a, a, a shy nerd dork uh that's trying to think that he's cooler than he is. There were so many people just saying some of the meanest, most screwed up stuff. And I'm sitting here saying Okay, it looks bad, but why don't we wait for a minute and hear what he's got to say about it? Maybe he'll flat out say none of this is true. Why don't we wait to see what he says? Why don't we wait a minute? Let's not have reactionary bullshit kind of responses. And um, some people were even going after Jim Rugg. Like, why is he not responding? Why is he not out there right up front either defending his homie or or completely abandoning him 100%. Why isn't he doing this? And eventually, um, you know, this is Monday when this all went down. I think it was last Friday. Jim Rugg did put out a post where he said, um, in light of recent allegations, I've had to reevaluate, you know, my situation and make sure that, you know, my, my professional situation aligns with my personal integrity and values. I'm paraphrasing here. And he said, that being said, I've ended my professional relationship with Ed Piscor, which is, that was hard to hear, but I can't help but it kind of wonder, like, I mean, it seems like the only thing that Jim could do, considering the shitstorm Ed was under, if Jim doesn't say, I'm going to distance myself from him, his career could be over too. And that's not fair to him. I feel like it might be the only thing he could do. I saw some people were saying he should have done that sooner. Why didn't he say something the instant it came out? And I suggested, um, I think an immediate reactionary kind of response is the wrong thing. He, he, he hears about it and then he has to hear what his buddy Ed has got to say about it. And then he's got a way... The situation on his own, on Jim's own career, what his wife thinks, what his family thinks, what does he do as a professional person, and just see what happens. And, and you have to sit and think on it. And eventually he made the choice that for whatever reason, however that came forward, he put forth that he was going to stop his professional association with Ed Piscor. And I thought that was absolutely the, the best kind of thing a person could do, a calm and measured response. That's... That's the only way to go about things rather than just like instantly freaking out. So I, I thought that was that was rough. And I couldn't help but wonder, like, what kind of conversation did Jim and Ed have together? Were there some shouting matches where they was is Jimmy like, dude, what the hell's going on? What are you doing? Or was it I don't believe it? I'm sorry. I'm here to back you up. I can even imagine a scenario, personally, pure conjecture on my part, where Ed saw his own shit going to hell, and he tells Jim Rugg, brother, just disavow me and go save your own career while you can. I'll deal with my shit, but you go solve your own shit and make yourself look good. Like, do the best you can. Don't go down with me by trying to defend me. I, I, could, I could imagine that being a situation that happened. But who knows? But, um... And like I said, it was I, I wasn't going to talk about this situation. I wasn't going to add conjecture to it. I wasn't going to throw in my opinion on the controversy. I wasn't going to try and like gain views 
by jumping on and doing videos. I'm like, oh my God, did you hear what he did? What do we think's going on? There's some real slimeball assholes out there that were doing that exact thing. And the only reason I'm talking about it now is because the situation is over. It's resolved. Ed Piscor killed himself and he's gone. And there's no more to know. The, uh, there's Anything else is just noise. It's just sad fallout from the situation. And so, and it's also got me really kind of emotional in a way that I did not expect. And I was like, well, maybe I should wait to talk about this, but I don't know. I just decided, like I said, I just, I'm just going to talk about it. Um, his suicide note, basically, uh, if you, if you saw that and read that, how could you think it was anything but shocking and just horrible to read? Uh, I've got some excerpts from it that I was going to look at. I mean, he wrote a big, long note. For those of you who didn't see it, like this is the text of it. I copied it. But if you see this, how long it is and all the information and stuff that he wrote and said in the final note to the world. Um, he says, like he finally said his piece. He said his part. He said, he's sorry for being stupid. I should never have talked with Molly. The language and optics look real dumb at best, but I promise my innocence, especially out of context, it looks terrible. He says, it was the height of COVID with no end in sight and I was alone through most of it. I was just happy to have the internet to talk to people with common interests. The way that I noticed her was that she would like a bunch of my pictures at once. Uh, I wasn't trolling Instagram randomly, but I definitely shouldn't have chatted with her when I found out how young she was. But seeing someone younger representing uh, R. Crumb and G.G. Allen, I'm sorry, I don't know who that is, gave me hope for the next generation and made me curious. Curiosity killed the cartoonist. There was no way I'd have a 17-year-old stay at my place. Um, he said I was... Uh, I was uh, forward projecting to some unknown future where COVID lockdowns were finished and we could see people again. Um, he talks about how the tone is missing from so many of the screenshots that everyone saw. You're like, you didn't see what he was talking about. You didn't see the entirety of the conversations. Um, he says, and he says, we're all in the art game, so why not introduce new friends to old friends? When I was bringing up any professional stuff to anybody, it was just common ground conversation, he says. Um, but then he talks about how the DMs were even further out of context on news outlets and media sites. Uh, newspaper articles were written that were just totally skewed to make it look as bad as possible. And he says, fuck you. Um, he says... But surely they gave themselves their own plausible deniability by asking me for comments right as I'm trying to not jump off a bridge or something. And then he talks about the other woman who spoke up and, and called him out and said that he did bad things. And he flat out denies that any of that ever happened. I mean, you can go look up this thing and read it in, in his entirety about what he said. Like, this never happened. That That's not the way it was. I don't get it. And he's like, I don't understand why she's doing this to me. But he says, my house was on fire and she threw gasoline on it. Um, yeah, he says, there needs to be recourse for my loved ones. I'm dead. I don't have a reason to lie. Hold her, hold her accountable, please. Reputation destruction is her form of aggression and there are very real consequences. Um... He says, I'm a solitary guy and I put every ounce of my time and life into my work for around the past 20 years. I never felt satisfied with my skills, so I constantly worked really hard and tied it all to my identity and self-worth. Every waking moment was spent working and ideally I thought it would be best to have friends who share the same passion. It's why I offered to introduce them to my friends. So I get that. I mean, us comic artists tend to be a shy kind of introverted lot and... My understanding of the situation is that Ed Piscor grew up in a, a, a shithole, poor-ass town to a poor family, and all he ever wanted to do was make comics, and he was really good at it. He understood it, and he built up his career on his own by working hard, uh, learning, exploring, figuring things out. And he built up a career and had a body of work that was paying dividends to him. He was making money, and he could live on the royalties and the money he gets off his body of work to then produce other work that he wanted to do. 
And a blink, and in a, in a, uh, in a blink of an eye, it was just uh, suddenly all gone. It's just over. It's all gone. He uh, talks about. He says, now it's all gone. Art show evaporated. He had an art show that was going to go on in his local hometown where he was living. And they were going to display his work, potentially get some sales out of that. That was gone. He says he was about to sign a $75,000 deal for Switchblade Shorties with Abrams. That's done. Cartoonist kayfabe ends with Jimmy's shocking revelation statement. And then he puts in parentheses, those words hurt. He says, I have no friends in this life any longer. I'm a disappointment to everyone who liked me. I'm a pariah, news organizations at my door and hassling my elderly parents. It's too much. Putting our addresses on TV and the internet. How could I ever go back to my small town where everyone knows me? Um, the part that really, one of the things that really kind of hit me emotionally is he says, you know, there was a lot of people that reached out to him. His uh, partner on the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, Jim Rugg, he says, Jim Rugg came to my house unsolicited and gave me a hug and told me he loves me. If you know Jimmy, you know how huge that is. That shit, like, touches me. Like, your brother, your friend, your, your, your partner in business who you love spending all this time with, he comes to you and sees that your shit's going up in flames and he hugs you and tells you he loves you and... That's why I'm like, I wonder what their conversations were like. Um, he uh, Ed continues in his letter. It says, I knew I wasn't going to be able to survive this. Comics is beyond a profession to me. It's everything. That might sound sad and pathetic to some, but this culture and medium gave me the greatest joy in my life. I can relate to that so hard. That that right there means everything to me. Um, if you make comics, you do it because you're a little bit crazy because it's hard. It's fun. It's creative. You get to sit down and draw pages and create a story. If you've got the discipline and the ability and the talent, you can create a story and, and have somebody read your work. But it's hard. It's not easy. And you, you, have, you do it because you love it, right? I'm making my stupid Masters of the Universe fan comic. It's nothing I can ever sell. I don't own it. But I have a story that I wanted to tell and I just started making it, and I just keep going. I just keep working on it. And as, as silly as it might be, I'm just going to keep going until it's done. Because I love comics. Um, I went through a divorce, and my art was put on hold while I was trying to work that thing out. And it's it's that kind of situation, as I think about this, that kind of makes the connection that makes it so kind of emotional for me. Cause Ed Piscor, he's sitting here talking in this note that he left, like his life was done. Like I said, he built it up from nothing. He uh, made his career. He had personal and professional respect and he had a little bit of a persona and a, I don't know, like a little bit of a, a, a vibe to his character on camera that some people found off-putting. I actually found him entertaining as hell. You know, he felt like he was kind of... I felt like he was real. Some people want to say he was fake. So whatever, we're going to have a difference of opinion on that. But Eddie just did what he wanted to do, did the kind of comics he wanted to do, and he didn't give a shit what anyone else thought about it. And the best part was, is he was successful. His hip-hop hip family tree has been very successful. His uh, X-Men Grand Design was very successful. His Red Room comic here was very successful. He was about to sign a $75,000 deal for the current thing he was working on. That man was making money, making the kind of comics he wanted to, and he was, make, he, he was able to make a living very comfortably. So he had all the room in the world to kind of talk egotistically because he, he earned it. If, you, if someone at least has an ego, as long as they've earned it, I kind of give a person a big pass. I'm like, yeah, all right. That's fair. You're talking a lot of kind of, you know, you're talking with a lot of attitude and, and vigor, but you've earned it because you're successful and I'm not. So good for you. I appreciate that. Some people couldn't stand it. They didn't like his attitude. They didn't like his, the fact that he wore that, that hat and wore the sunglasses on the inside and he talked with this kind of street lingo. I actually found him entertaining as hell. You know, I think he was, I, I think it was great. I enjoyed listening to him, but he also had such expansive, vast knowledge on comics. It, 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 
showed that he was not just some, he wasn't just a loud voice. He was a guy who was educated in the material. And that speaks volumes. But he built up this career in his own little empire, and it was all gone. It's all gone. He's the worst person on the planet, according to some people. And there's no way back, and it's terrible. And I, it, and he decided, I guess, that the only way out was to just end it all. Now, that's the one part of the situation that actually pisses me off, is that he decided to do that. Ending your life is never, ever, ever the solution. It's never the answer, because you've just lumped all kinds of unbelievable pain upon everybody who's around you. His parents now have to bury one of their children. He's got some brothers and sisters, if I understand correctly, and some of them have uh, kids. He's got nieces and nephews. Uncle Eddie's gone. And now they're going to cry and wonder, and they have to deal with that. And that's the part that's, that's the unforgivable part, is that he felt like this was the way out. It's just, it's just not okay. You, all that pain now goes on to them. Uh, my uh, ex-wife, she uh, works for the uh, suicide prevention team with the VA, with veterans. And she would talk to me about statistics and stuff like that when we were together. And she would tell me, statistically speaking, like if you end your own life and you, you've got kids, for example, you th those kids now have a 50% chance of doing it themselves now. And um, in context, like I've got two children. So if I were to do that to myself, one of my kids is almost assuredly, statistically speaking, to do the same thing at some point in his, in his life. And that's just so unbearably difficult to imagine. Now, Ed doesn't have any children, but there's still family and friends that love him and everyone's suffering the pain and sadness of that now. Um, the only thing that I can say is that when I went through my divorce, when day one of it started back in 2016 and it ended up being a three-year crumbling of the life that my wife and I had built. And it was the hardest thing I'd ever gone through in my life. It was unbearably hard. I put my art away and didn't touch anything for like more than a year. Just it's all put away. I'm focusing on how can I fix things with my wife? How can I rebuild our family? Because we had a three-year-old son and a one-year-old baby. And, um, how, how do you go on? And I remember uh, years before at my job, I knew a guy who uh, was about 10 years older than me. He was about the age I am now, but uh, this was 15 years ago or something like that. And he was telling me when I, I was just, I was happy. I was fine. I was married. We had our first kid and everything was great. But this buddy of mine, he was talking to me at work about how he had gone through a divorce and he was so fucking miserable going through that. He told me that one time, he says, Rob, I thought about ending it all. I'm like, what? I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I worked a night shift and I was driving home and it was a long, dark highway. and There was no one on the road. But then coming the other direction was like a big semi truck coming the other direction on the highway. And he's like, Rob, I thought about just unbuckling my seatbelt and letting my car drift right in front of that semi and boom, it's done. Then I won't be in pain and sad anymore. And I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard. Like, are you kidding me? You'd be willing to do that because of a divorce? Well, once I went through it, once I felt that pain and the constant sadness and the misery, I those thoughts crossed my mind too. I knew that I would never actually do it, but I thought about it. I thought about like, well, there's a firearm over there and it's three in the morning. I could just walk out into the middle of the street in the cul-de-sac that we're in and I'll just, you know, make a little gesture with my finger with this uh, firearm and it's done and let her find me there and then she'll be happy. How about that? Like I wanted to punish her and I wanted to be free of the pain. And then I had those thoughts and I'd come back to my reality and be like, that's really fucking dark. That's horrible. That's so horrible to think of. But... And I, I knew I never would because, you know, I just, I, I never got that far. And I got kids that I knew needed me and I knew that life could get better. And it did. I'm better. I'm, I'm better off now than I was. I, I'm sad that I went through a divorce. I wish that it never happened. I wish I was still with her, honestly. But since it's over, I've found happiness and I'm okay. So it's a different situation from Ed, but... I get it where your life, like we had 
a big, huge house and cars, and we could take trips, and I had beautiful children, an expansive family on both sides, my family, her family. Everything was great. I had all kinds of shit that I was never going to have on my own. She was way more educated and financially stable than I ever was, and suddenly I had a great life. I was better off than I was ever going to be, and boom, it's all done. It's all gone, and I'm basically out on my own with the clothes on my back and the, my car, and then I just start over. And if it wasn't for the connections of family and friends that kept me going, um, those of you who watch the channel, uh, you know that uh, Jessica, one of my best friends on the planet, um, she's joined me on lives and does, does the live streams and she's done some videos where we're talking to each other. She's one of the people, for example, like we knew each other a long time ago and then there was a gap of a couple years where we honestly lost contact with each other. And when I was moved out into this house I'm in right now, in those first couple of months, I was just digging through my phone and I was and I found her phone number still in my phone and I sent her a message and it was still her and we reconnected as friends and she kept me going as a friend. You know, I've had, I have family, I have brothers and sisters and parents and I have a couple other close friends, but I didn't get to see them as often. But like Jessica, for example, was always there to as, for like a kind word and a conversation. And it's so simple to help somebody make their way through that kind of a situation by just being a voice to listen to you. And so I owe Jessica more than I can ever explain. And she knows this. And she's told me that she's been through some rough patches. Sometimes I didn't even know she was going through as rough a patch as she was saying. But just having a friend there willing to listen keeps you going. So again, I'm just coming back to the whole thing of the fact that Ed did this and didn't think that there was any way out. It breaks my heart, but it also the pain that he's thrown onto other people. I just, it just, it's just miserable. It's super, super sucks. And I wish it never happened. Again, I want to make sure I reiterate, um, whatever he may have done doesn't look good. Um, it shouldn't have happened. He should have been smarter. He should have not been talking to anybody underage like that. Like another friend of mine, Mr. Chuck said, like, if you're talking, if you're an older guy and you're talking to an underage girl, you better talk to them like you're at church in front of their parents, in front of God and everybody and keep your shit straight and clean and not even dare to cross the line because you're stupid in this world if you dare to say anything, even hinting at inappropriateness because you'll be done. Your life and your career will be finished. And so Ed should have been way more careful, but he didn't really do anything illegal and he didn't deserve the mob mentality that was out to get him. And it's really really, really frustrating that this was his way out. And uh, my heart goes out to his family, to his friends, to Jim Rugg, who has to figure out what the hell he's going to do with himself professionally from here forward. Uh, Tom Scioli, the other guy that was always on their channel, uh, sucks that they have to kind of, you know, what do you do with the channel? Where do you go from here? So the only other thing that I can kind of say is um, – Art and creativity are a great outlet. Go make a thing. If you're a musician, go make the song. If you're a painter, go make that painting. If you're a guy who likes to make comics, go make the comic. Go make it. Go finish it. Go do it. Go be creative. Make things in the world. Make something fun and entertaining because the world is miserable enough as it is. And the creative parts of those of us out there, we can make things that – help people get through the day. I hear all the time about how people thank musicians for their albums because their music got them through their childhood. Or people had a horrible, miserable life, but reading comics gave them a world to slip away into and get away from their miserable childhood or, or things like that. And even as adults, same thing. So... I don't know. I feel like I've rambled on long, on long enough. No one gives a shit what I think about any of this, but um, I just wanted to say something. I'm, 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 I'm heartbroken. It's, I'm sad and miserable. Eh, I'm not miserable, but I'm, I'm sad and it sucks. And 
I'm pissed off at the mob mentality, seeing all these people online that were just anxious for him just to be destroyed. And now a lot of them are kind of backtracking. Oh, this sucks. I'm like, oh, I remember reading your reply, buddy. Two days ago, you're like, he needs to be, he needs to be done forever. He's disgusting. He's this, he's that. He's all these terrible words I don't, I don't even want to repeat. Um, there's a lot of people out there that added to this. The mob mentality just jumping on him and not even giving him a chance to like wait and measure his response and formulate a reply and decide what he's going to do that pushed a guy to a place that he shouldn't have gone, but it's what happened and it's, he's fucking gone. And now what do you do? So, you know, be better, be calm, be patient, wait to hear how things go. Hear both sides of a story before you jump onto one side or the other understand a situation before you immediately are ready to just destroy a person that you don't know from the anonymity of your phone. Be better be human beings. Be better people. Because the world's now a little bit darker place. It's just a little bit darker than it was before. And uh, it's pretty dark as it is. And any little bit of lights out there, the joy that people got from making comics and what these guys did, it's gone. You know? It sucks. So in the greatest tradition of what they would always say on their channel, um, I'll end it with the great catch phrase that I am going to do as soon as I get off this, this uh, video that I'm making here. Make more comics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.